Thank you so much for coming today. I know the sun is uh, calling us all outside, and I really appreciate you guys coming in. I hope to make it worth your while. <laughs> so first of all, uh, we're going to talk about um, identifying and managing chronic pain. And I'm surprised every time I talk to owners when they're not sure if that's a pain sign or not. Um, so we're going to talk about acute versus chronic pain first so that we understand what we mean by chronic pain. Um, first of all, acute pain is that sensory response where you do something that hurts yourself and the body's trying to tell you to stop that. So you put your hand on a hot stove. Um, it also includes uh, having surgery. That's an induced type of traumatic acute pain. Um, trauma where you've injured yourself, of course. Uh, chronic pain is a completely different animal. Um, it starts as acute, but then is prolonged. And what happens when that uh, pain continues in your body is it recruits other uh, receptors that aren't usually involved in the pain process. And then they too are giving pain signals, which makes everything much worse. Um, so they're not doing any good and we have to shut down some of those pain signals in order to get an animal comfortable. So the problem with chronic pain is that uh, when it's ongoing, we get negative physiological and hormonal responses. And what that means for us is that uh, our pets and people are going to have a decreased ability to heal. Uh, the underlying disease that is probably causing the pain needs to be fixed, and the body's just not going to be able to do that with pain on board. Protein catabolism, what that means for us is that the muscles start to break down. Um, and then we have an increase in retention of water and sodium, and that leads to edema. Impaired nutrient delivery to cells, this means it's another step in not being able to heal. Uh, we just don't get the energy that we need to the cells to uh, try to come back from that. And long term, this leads to physiologic and emotional exhaustion. And this is for the pet as well as sometimes for the owner. You know, trying to take care of an animal that's been sick and in pain for a long time really wears you down, wears both of you down. Now, why this becomes an issue, especially in the veterinary side of things, is that it's a quality of life issue. And if an animal's not able to lie down comfortably, then they're not going to sleep properly, and we lose our appetite, then they don't want to be handled or pet. They tend to um, just withdraw and appear to give up. And a lot of people attribute this to old age and, uh, and start to consider euthanasia as how we're going to put them out of their pain, because they are in pain. They are suffering. So multimodal analgesia is how we try to approach this. And what that means is that we're attacking that pain from many different aspects. And the point of that is if we can alter pain for these animals in many different fashions, then we're going to be less uh, reliant on drugs. And then if we don't need as many drugs, we don't need as many side effects. So multimodal analgesia, what I'm talking about, we're going to use prescriptions, we're going to use nutrition, we're going to do nutraceuticals, which includes supplements, uh, alternative medicine, and that includes acupuncture and class 4 therapy laser, also physical uh, therapy, rehabilitation medicine. And the point of all this is to break the pain cycle, um, reduce the side effects that may come with prescriptions, or try to get them to the lowest possible dose possible, and make it a manageable situation for the owner especially. It has to be something that they can do. Um, since we're Viking Veterinary Care, <laughs> we take pictures of dogs and helmets a lot. So <laughs> you'll see that as we go on. <laughs> this is Bart. This is uh, our mascot and my dog. <laughs> So um, some signs that we're going to see with um, pain that might be nonspecific. They don't really tell us exactly what's going on. Um, certainly behavior changes are a big one, and that's one that only you as the owner may know. Uh, and that's something where you're going to have to be the advocate for your pet because your vet's not going to know if your cat's more quiet than normal in the veterinary office after they've just been tempted. Like, <laughs> that's not something that we're going to pick up on, so it's going to be up to you to tell us that. Are they withdrawing from the family or other pets? Are they not playing anymore? Um, like I said, you have to be your pet's advocate. Changes in bathroom habits can be a big one, especially in cats. Are they not going in the litter box? Are, they, are you finding uh, poop right next to the litter box? <laughs> That's one of my favorites. It's like, we got there, but not quite. Um, 
you know, those are things that uh, accidents in the house. This might be that the dog or the cat just can't move around like they used to. Maybe it's too far to the door from where they were at. Or in cats, you know, might be too far to the litter box where it used to be easy. Or the litter box is upstairs and that's kind of a long haul. If you just woke up, you're stiff and sore and you have arthritis and it just might not happen. <laughs> Uh, weight loss or weight gain, again, that's something that's going to be individual by animal. Um, sometimes we're going to gain weight because we're not moving around as much. Sometimes we're going to lose weight because our muscle's breaking down. Sometimes it's both. Uh, they'll have more fat but lose the muscle. So nonspecific signs of pain continued. We were looking at a poor hair coat. The animal can't groom because they can't move to reach the spots that they used to uh, clean themselves up. Uh, staring with a fixed gaze, uh, they just kind of seem zoned out, and that's, uh, they're in pain. They're trying to block it out as best they can. Vocalizing, and alternatively, this can also be going quiet. You know, if you have a Siamese, and now it's quiet Siamese, <laughs> something's probably wrong. Uh, the body temp and blood pressure tend to go up with uh, long-term pain, as well as the heart rate and respiratory rates. So something else that you can kind of monitor at home or in your patients. Cats, cats are tricky. <laughs> the big movement along the uh, feline practitioner front is that in order to assess pain in cats, what you need to do is an analgesic trial. And what that means is you're putting them on pain control and seeing if their behaviors improve. And if they do, then yeah, that was probably pain related. And if they don't, we might need to focus on other things. So this is the, the newest idea as far as how do we uh, properly assess cats. Because we haven't been good at it. And uh, this is a statement from Dr. Margie Shirk. She's a, a feline practitioner. And she says, we can't always know that it does hurt, but we can know that it doesn't. So I'm going to address mostly three centers of pain uh, that we see long term, especially in the veterinary field. And the first one is musculoskeletal. And it includes all of these bad boys. So um, we worry about arthritis, degenerative joint disease, dysplasia. We're going to kind of use those interchangeably today. They do mean different things slightly, <laughs> but um, not for the purposes of what we're going to discuss. Uh, intervertebral disc disease, that is where you have a um, protrusion of the disc into the spinal cord, so it causes neurologic issues. That's the herniated disc. Um, that's the, the dachshund disease. <laughs> um, cruciate ligament tear, you're probably all familiar with that. It's where the ligament that stabilizes the knee joint has been torn or partially torn, and that knee joint is no longer stable, and dogs have a lot of trouble bearing weight on that leg. Growth deformities. You can't tell me that this dog is not going to have <laughs> musculoskeletal disease. Uh, nice little basset hound legs. Uh, so also trauma, getting hit by a car, uh, having a fracture, uh, things like that will set us up for musculoskeletal disease long term. And then cancer certainly causes uh, ongoing chronic pain. And there are a lot of things that you can do for cancer that are going to be beyond the realm of, again, what we're going to discuss today. There was so much info. I just... <laughs> had to bar it down. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> I love this picture. <laughs> We've all been there. <laughs> so, musculoskeletal pain, <laughs> reluctant to sit, uh, lay down. They tend to be restless, especially at night. They don't want to jump or use the stairs. They'll try to get around doing those kinds of things. Um, and again, frequently misinterpreted as getting old. And uh, we like to say in our industry, age is not an illness. <laughs> So muscle atrophy is an example of a hyperthyroid cat. And you can bet with all the muscle loss that we've had with our uh, metabolism being ramped up that she's not going to be able to move around as well. And, uh, and so this leads me to the next issue in that we need to fix everything that's fixable. But we'll get there. So this is also something... Um, <laughs> Vets can't go to the dog park and not look at this stuff. <laughs> so uh, what I'm looking at on this guy, um, this is a boxer, and this leg, totally normal, good musculature. This, not so much. Something's missing. Uh, he's lost all of this muscle mass right here, and that's from a, a chronic um, cruciate ligament tear. So self-mutilation, another sign of musculoskeletal pain. This is an example of a lick granuloma. And what that means, animals will pay more attention to either an area that hurts 
or uh, it will become a stress response for them where if they lick their skin cons consistently in one spot, it releases endorphins and then rewards that behavior for them and, and helps them to feel calm and not stressed. Difficulty rising and lowering. So I'm gonna see, I'm hoping this will play. This is what we were trying to doctor. <laughs> this is Bo and he is one of my, I, I do a lot of giant breed dogs because we have giant breed dogs. And this guy is seven years old, and this is what he's already doing at home. And I frequently ask owners to film if you're trying to explain to your vet what you're seeing. Try to figure out what hurts in Bo. All right. Any hips? The, his back, certainly. What else are we seeing? Definitely something up with the front limbs. Um, he kind of doesn't want to bend anything. <laughs> um, and this is after we fixed his back end. <laughs> so um, he doesn't want to move his spine. He has some arthritis going on in his shoulders and in the digits. And so he just kind of tries to get it all down without bending anything because it hurts. So side sitting. Well, we'll talk about some things that we're going to do to fix that. <laughs> That's funny. Bo, we actually saw for hind limb issues first, and then this developed after the back limbs were much better. <laughs> so this is something, again, that your veterinarians are looking at at the dog park, side sitting. So this is an example of what a normal sit should look like. It's nice this is a whippet, so you can see everything perfectly lined up. And, uh, and what I'm looking at here, this is a normal dog. So hips are dropped directly behind the spine. There's no knees sticking out to the side. She's sitting very square and both angles. So this is not normal sit. Um, this is called side sitting. And these guys are trying to protect the leg that has been injured as well as keep from bending it. So typically it's the leg underneath, but it can be both legs because once we've hurt one cruciate ligament, we've likely injured the other because we're bearing most of our weight on one leg now. So we tend to see bilateral disease, and so when they're sitting, everything's shifted to the side because it hurts to bend everything. Uh, the other thing that I thought was interesting looking at, at these slides, it's a very typical presentation for cruciate ligament disease. These are all young, probably very active, muscular dogs who are a tiny bit overweight, and so they probably have all blown out their cruciate ligament or at least partially torn it. So cats should not be overlooked in this realm of musculoskeletal disease. We do believe that osteoarthritis is very underdiagnosed in them. Um, there was a recent study that evaluated 100 cats that were over the age of 12, and they weren't looking for, it. these were cats that had come into a hospital and were seen for a number of different illnesses. And so the radiologist just went back and looked at all of their x-rays and just tried to determine, do cats show osteoarthritis on an x-ray. And what they found is that 90% of these cats, 90%, 90 cats out of 100, showed evidence of degenerative joint disease on their x-rays. And you guys want to guess the number of cats in which that was actually a concern in their chart? Or? 4%, 5 Close. You guys are real close. 4 Yeah. I know. Nice job. I'd throw something like candy, but I don't have any. <laughs> so the other thing about osteoarthritis in cats is that there's an articular cartilage component to it, and that's something that we're not going to be able to see on the x-rays. Um, the cartilage breaks down long before there's bony lesions. So what we're looking at here, this is a normal knee, and this is a knee where the cartilage has started to break down, and that can cause osteoarthritis in cats. But we're not going to know, even if we're taking x-rays, other than doing that pain test, trying the pain medication, seeing if things get better. Largely undetected. So another common cause of pain, especially in cats, is urinary tract disease. And this is something that has to be managed long term as well. So things that can cause urinary tract disease in cats, we were about stress cystitis, crystals that can cause urinary obstruction, spasming or strain, uh, trying to urinate and not being able to. 
and urinary stones. It's actually a stone I pulled out of a cocker spaniel. Yeah, it was a good one. <laughs> Infection um, and cancer, again, is always on the list of issues causing chronic pain. So, yes, that is a bladder stone. And this is like the little cap to the end of the bladder stone. And that was just sitting in there clanking. <laughs> Uh, again, urinary tract disease in cats, it makes it hurt for them to pee. And so when they go in the litter box and they try to pee and it hurts, they're going to try somewhere else because clearly that litter box is hurting me. So I'm going to try the bath mat and I'm going to try the laundry and I'm going to try your bed. You know, it's not necessarily that they might be trying to show you that they have something wrong with their pee. They might just be like, the bed is my happy place. That's where I hang out with my people and it probably won't hurt me. But it, but it is. So that's what house soiling is when we have an underlying infection. You also see cats straining to urinate, especially boy cats. And this is when they're in the litter box, they're trying to pee, and nothing's coming out. Or you see much smaller clumps in the litter box because they're trying. But again, it's, it's a smaller amount. Things are spasming and clamping down, and they can't get a good steady stream. And this is a chronic pain disease for a lot of cats. Um, they tend to overgroom again, in areas of pain. So when your cat comes in like this... I'm going to be wondering what's going on in the bladder. So common causes uh, of dental disease. And uh, I actually wanted to change this and call it oral pain rather than dental disease. So um, animals with dental disease and, and oral pain, it can be a number of different things. We worry about fractured teeth, of course, especially in dogs that chew things that are really hard. They tend to fracture the molars that are in the, the very back, the huge ones that are really hard to take out. <laughs> Dental abscesses, this is where you have an infected tooth. Lymphoplasmacytic stomatitis. Um, anyone ever had a cat with this? Basically what it is, the body's immune system attacks the cat's own teeth. And it's really painful. And it causes long-term irritation and inflammation. And the treatment long-term is to pull all the teeth. Is resorption another name for that? No, resorption is usually secondary to an abscess. So one, especially in cats, when they have a dental abscess, they start to break down the tooth and uh, try to resorb it. Um, cancer, also a big one. This is a, um, if you can see, this is the jaw, and this is a huge hemangio, or, uh, uh, melanoma, malignant melanoma. This was a little rat terrier who would scream any time the other dogs came near it because he didn't want to get touched around here. And dogs and cats that are especially painful in their mouth, they're not going to let you look in there. So that's when we have to do that sedated exam or at least uh, consider doing anesthesia. Um, so periodontal disease, this is the progression into dental disease. And this is because there's residual food, bacteria, tartar, they collect between the gums and the tooth and they start to uh, just cause an ongoing infection. And that infection spreads to the bone and that's how your tooth get, gets loose because that bone is infected and it can't hold the tooth anymore. It's not healthy. And I've had dentals where the bone is like a sponge. I mean, it is so infected that it is soft and then we're at, we're at danger of fracturing the jaw, honestly. Um, so surprisingly, in recent studies, they found that 8 out of 10 dogs and 7 out of 10 cats already have some kind of oral disease before the age of 3. Like 3. We don't even think about doing dentals in them until they're older and there's a problem. But we need to start thinking about doing it sooner to prevent us from getting to that. <laughs> So again, oral pain, things that we're going to be looking for, dropping food, dropping toys. <laughs> Hopefully this one will play too. This is my own dog, Bart, again. This is him trying to eat. And then I found out that my, let's see if it'll let me do it. My camera has slow mode. Yeah. Here we go. He's like, Rawr. So, yeah, his tongue is not working right. <laughs> He's just not grabbing the kibbles and pulling them into the back of his mouth. And, and this is my own dog. I was like, oh, we're going in, buddy. <laughs> it's too bad you just ate because I really want to sedate you right now. 
that was pre-dental, yes. And I'll show you what I found on that too. So other signs of oral pain, they'll get head shy. Um, like I said, with the rat terrier, they might start getting really protective and screamy. Um, weight loss, because clearly they're not eating well. Chewing on one side of the mouth versus the other, uh, especially if there's a fractured tooth only on one side. Pine or rubbing at the face. Also bleeding from the mouth. You might see blood in the water, blood on chew toys, blood on rawhides, uh, and a bad smell. This is like, if it's a chihuahua with a bad smell, <laughs> we need to do a dental. <laughs> So this is not BART in particular, but this is what I found on BART. When I found it, I was so horrified that I just started plucking immediately before I took a picture. And what this is is hair embedded in the tongue. There's two different schools of thought on this. Um, they can actually overgroom themselves and get hair that embeds into the tongue and causes infection and little ulcers. Um, there's also been some documented cases where dogs will grow hair out of their tongue. That's not the case with Bart. He's been anesthetized a lot, and there's never been hair in there before. So, um, yeah, but like I said, I just started pulling hair out crazy, but uh, it was all ulcerated and it had little pockets of pus along these embedded hair pieces. So his teeth looked great. <laughs> oh, more dogs and helmets. <laughs> So the first step when we're doing a treatment plan is to figure out, again, everything that's wrong. And the best way to do that is go to your vet, have a comprehensive exam. And what I mean by comprehensive exam is stem to stern, if take video, uh, bring in fecal samples, bring in urine sample if you can. We just want to check out everything. And especially with musculoskeletal pain or um, not moving as much, we definitely want to do an orthopedic or a neurologic exam or both. And what that means is the vet's testing different things. We're going to check every joint from tip of the toes all the way up to the shoulder, on everything that moves, and see what's painful. Because chances are, if one joint is affected, there's another joint affected somewhere too because they're going to be compensating. So a neurologic exam, we're checking reflexes. We want to know, is there an impingement? Is there evidence of a, of a herniated disc because the signal's not coming from the spinal cord to the back legs? So when you see your vet um, flipping over the back legs on your dog so that they're this way and, and then we just sit there and wait, <laughs> we want to see that foot flip back over because that means that the brain knows where the foot is. And if they're just standing there on the top of their foot with it flipped over, something's not signaling right. And that leads us to different uh, choices in treatment modalities depending on how we respond to these tests. So lab work, very, very important because we're probably going to be doing medications and we need to know that an animal is going to process those medications correctly. So typical lab work that we'd start with is a chemistry at least. Um, we want to know uh, kidney values and liver enzymes because most of the drugs that we use for pain are going to be processed by those organs. Uh, other things we want to know, complete blood cell count, that tells us is there evidence of infection somewhere that we need to hunt down and fix. Um, urinalysis, sometimes, or I should say all the time, a urinalysis with that, that's very dilute is our first clue that there's something wrong with the kidneys. There has to be 70% of the kidney mass affected before we start to see those kidney enzymes go up on the blood work. And that's a lot. Whereas with how well we're concentrating our urine, like I said, it's not that, we don't have to wait for the kidneys to be that far gone in order to see that change. So if our urine, especially the first sample in the morning, is really dilute, that's a sign of kidney disease. Uh, and especially if we're dealing with older animals, we always want to rule out a urinary tract infection too. You'd be amazed at the way that that can manifest as pain in some of these guys, from changing their behavior to having pain you know, what we would think is back pain, and it's not, it's kidney pain. Um, so thyroid as well. If we have a hyperthyroid cat, they're going to process drugs a lot faster <laughs> than a normal animal would. Uh, if we have a hypothyroid dog who's overweight and has musculoskeletal disease, if we speed that thyroid up, they're going to lose some of that weight, and it's going to really help their joints. So we want to know some of these things because it helps us in a lot of ways with the pain management. Radiographs, we're looking for which joints are affected and how bad, and to rule out cancer. 
there's some things that you're going to want to do differently if it's cancer versus osteoarthritis. So Dr. Robin Downing has the Downing Center for Animal Pain Management, and it's a, it's a huge center. And she repeatedly says at all of her seminars, treat the treatable and treat all of the treatable. And that goes back to doing the full exam, doing the ortho exam, doing the neuro exam, do the blood work, do the urinalysis, try to figure out everything that's wrong so that we can make everything right that we possibly can. I know sometimes that's not possible, and we'll talk about some things that we can do to help out when that's the case. But um, we want to rule out any concurrent problems, again, that are, that are gonna affect how we process those drugs, because that also may tell us what the side effects are gonna be too. Dehydration, malnutrition need to be addressed um, before we continue as well. So then we need to take care of the immediate concern. Is there a surgical or anesthetic procedure that can help? And this includes joint arthrodesis or replacement. Arthrodesis is where you fuse the joints so it doesn't hurt anymore when they're moving. Joint replacement, you can do hip replacements in dogs uh, and cats. And there's, there's a number of different surgical procedures that may help. Uh, doing a dental or oral evaluation under anesthesia, checking for things that are infected with a dental. Highly, highly recommend doing the dental radiographs too because some of the stuff that you're gonna find is under the surface like an iceberg. <laughs> Urinary blockage, of course we have to fix that right away because that's a life-threatening issue. <laughs> Stem cell therapy is an option too, uh, a little beyond what I'm able to cover today, but some to discuss with your vet, as well as hyaluronic acid joint injections. Again, beyond the realm of what we can do today. Some environmental changes you can do at home though, you know, certainly wanna do some ramp stairs, baby gates, trying to make sure an animal that can't move well isn't gonna fall down the stairs repeatedly. <laughs> um, warm, soft, padded beds. This is so important in animals that have arthritis because they have enough trouble getting comfortable and this is something that's gonna help them. Adding more litter boxes, maybe of a different kind. Um, in cats that have arthritis, they like to have lower edges, so it's easier for them to get in and out. And you might have to add more to the environment so that they can uh, get to one quicker than trying to get up the stairs to the one litter box in the house. Create a safe zone. This is something I highly, highly recommend for any senior animal, probably any animal really. Um, have a place where they can go to rest. That is away from the children, it's away from the other pets. Uh, if they want a nice quiet place, they can retreat and go back to their safe place. And, and that's important because it's important in the healing process. So nutrition, uh, weight loss. <laughs> if you can't read it, it says, I'm not fat, I'm just a little husky. <laughs> so weight loss is the number one thing that clients can do to help their pets uh, with musculoskeletal issues, with cystitis in cats. As we know, fat leads to inflammation. And that inflammation can be in the joints as well as in the bladder. And so trying to get as much weight off of an animal that has chronic pain as possible is only gonna help them, uh, unless they're too skinny. Uh, so nutrition also includes prescription diets. And I'm not gonna go through different prescription diets because again, we're beyond what we can do today. But um, prescription diets, and uh, the emphasis on that is prescription. I mean, we shouldn't think of this as food. This is a, this is a treatment, this is a drug. And the whole point of this is to decrease any other medications that we need to be on so there's less side effects. Um, some of these animals could be managed on prescription diets alone. And uh, weight management diets are available, ones with joint support, urinary diets, as well as things that will decrease anxiety. And anxiety can amp up pain too, so there's some options there as well. So discuss with your veterinarian. More dogs and helmets. <laughs> So next step, what do we do now? We've, we've narrowed down a bunch of stuff. We know what we're treating. How are we gonna treat it? So with drugs, drugs are good. Uh, <laughs> we wanna start with drugs, and, but we also need to think about other things like chondroprotectants. What that means, these are things that are gonna protect the cartilage and the joint acid and keep those things happy and so the joints can keep moving. Supplements. Alternative therapies, again, that includes acupuncture and class four therapy laser. There are several other alternative therapies. That's what I'm most familiar with that we'll talk about today. Um, physical therapy, this is also rehabilitation medicine. But we'll start with NSAIDs, because this is kind of where it always starts. Um, NSAIDs is short for non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug. And what that means is it's anti-inflammatory. 
Um, it's the mainstay of osteoarthritis and synovitis. Synovitis is when the joint lining is inflamed too. And why this is important, these are the drugs that work for these conditions. Like they are the number one choice. They are the most effective, but they are not by any means innocent. Um, they have been shown to decrease lameness, uh, increase the use of the limb or limbs that are affected. They clearly relieve pain and that increases, that benefit increases with time. The longer you're on a non-steroidal, the less pain they seem to show in studies. Uh, owners report that they also increase their spontaneous activity and the, the pets seem more happy. The nice thing too is it doesn't cause sedation. The only thing it's altering is your pain sensation. And the reason that that's important, I have a lot of people who we start their dog on carprofen, which is the generic Rimadyl, and they're like, oh my gosh, he's sleeping so much. Well, that's not because of the Rimadyl. <laughs> it's probably because that animal's been in pain and he's tired. And so we're actually getting some good quality sleep and we need to give it some time to adjust. And then once the inflammation is controlled, we can often back off the dose to, we always want to do the lowest possible dose that's going to be effective for that pet. Now, there's several, there's a couple different classes of NSAIDs. There's two, and plus or minus three, depending on which presentation you go to. And, um, but there's a little, little clinical difference between the two, meaning what we see in our patients between the different classes hasn't been different. Um, but when we're talking about individual animals, they may have a preference, uh, their body may prefer one NSAID over another. A dog may do great on Rimadyl, but horrible on Medicam. Or they might do fine on Medicam and not on Deramax. Uh, so it's worth trying several different ones, even if you feel like, oh, my dog totally puked his guts out on Rimadyl, we're not gonna use any NSAIDs anymore. There are some other options, and just changing to a different anti-inflammatory might be what that dog needs. So kidney and liver disease. If we have underlying kidney or liver disease, it is going to get worse on NSAIDs. So that's important to know because we need to do that blood work and make sure that we're not harming the patient by giving him drugs. Um, screening blood work we usually start with. So baseline, uh, when you come in for that first assessment exam, if we're starting on an anti-inflammatory, uh, an NSAID, and we're going to stay on it consistently, I wanna see blood work again after three weeks. Um, and then every six months to a year after that, depending on the underlying condition in the dog or the cat. Um, why that's also important, sometimes with quality of life issues, we'll be like, hey, let's just do what we can for this dog. If the owner understands the risk that we might be damaging the kidney or liver, but this dog is borderline euthanasia, yeah, we're probably gonna try the, the NSAID. Um, our lawyers are telling us that we need to get an against medical advice form if that happens. So if someone passes you that form to sign because we're doing NSAIDs in your animal without doing blood work, that's why. It's unfortunately, we have to protect ourselves. So um, this is rare, but uh, there are a few cases where an individual animal will develop liver failure on a anti-inflammatory. Um, there are millions of dogs on and SEDS, but few and far between, you'll see this. And this is another reason for us to do that recheck blood work and make sure it's not happening. Labradors are overrepresented as far as breeds that will develop this liver failure. Side effects with NSAIDs other than liver failure? <laughs> uh, vomiting, diarrhea, loss of appetite. These all fall under gastrointestinal ulceration. So just like aspirin, just like ibuprofen, dogs and cats can get ulcers with NSAIDs. I should say just like aspirin and ibuprofen in people, don't use them in your dogs. Um, <laughs> NSAIDs will also impair platelet activity, so sometimes we'll take an animal off of them before we're doing a surgery where we anticipate there's gonna be a lot of bleeding, like a mass removal perhaps. Um, NSAIDs need to be dosed on lean body weight. That means if you have a 120 pound lab, and it should be an 80 pound lab, and you have that bottle of Medicam at home, and the dosing syringe is based on weight, you don't wanna pull up a 120 pound dose of Medicam. <laughs> we wanna do the 80 pound dose of Medicam. And uh, otherwise, the way that the body metabolizes it, it's an overdose. So dose on lean body weight. Here are the thou shalt nots of NSAIDs. And I kid you not, thou shalt not. Um, 
Never, ever, ever use NSAIDs with aspirin, ibuprofen, naproxen, steroids, and these have happened. I, when I was doing my internship here at Dove Lewis, we had the 120-pound lab, who should have been 80, had cruciate ligament disease, uh, just had surgery. The owners had been giving the dog Motrin at home, which is an ibuprofen. Uh, the surgeon then put the dog on Meloxicam. Over-the-counter medications are still medications, so we need to make sure that the vet knows that that's something that they've been on. The dog actually came in uh, post-op with bad abdominal pain, not eating, vomiting, and it turned out that he had a perforated ulcer in his stomach, and they had just spent $3,000 to get the knee fixed. The dog had to go to emergency surgery and didn't make it, because once you have bacteria from ruptured bowel in the abdomen, there's only a 50% chance they're gonna make it. And unfortunately, she didn't. And, uh, and so never, ever, ever mix these guys. And don't ever change the dose without consulting your veterinarian. Uh, more does not mean that it's better. Uh, more means you've just overdosed. So a note about NSAIDs in cats. This is very interesting. In cats, they actually process NSAIDs differently than dogs. It goes through uh, a pathway that cats have not as good of a uh, processing plant, and that's the glucuronidation pathway. You don't have to know that. <laughs> what you need to know is that cats can't process this as well. And it makes it so that there's a lot longer um, effect of that drug in their body. Carprofen, which is rumidil, has been shown in cats to have a half-life, meaning it's half gone in nine to 40 hours. In dogs, that number's six. You know, by 12 hours, you have to redose them. So nine to 40 hours, that's huge, and it leads to drug accumulation. Drug accumulation leads to side effects. This cat is effectively overdosed on an NSAID and is getting gastric ulcers. The other thing we worry about with cats and NSAIDs, kidney failure. There has been lots of reports about cats having kidney failure with NSAIDs, and for a long time, NSAIDs were not labeled for use in cats. So some of the doses were, not, were, were higher than what we have found should be for kitties. And uh, there's been a lot of research on that lately. Uh, I know even as a veterinarian, I'm still scared to death of causing kidney failure by dosing with uh, a NSAID, especially, uh, yeah, it's just scary. <laughs> We've all seen it, and um, we don't want to go there. So in general, it's not, NSAIDs are not licensed for long-term use in cats. Now that may be changing. There's a new study, a couple new studies, but the most important one was based out of Australia. Oh, this was an older one that showed um, that meloxicam, which is an anti-inflammatory, it's the liquid NSAID, uh, it's been shown to be metabolized differently, especially in cats. And what this means is that it's probably completely metabolized before it gets to the kidneys. It's actually being excreted in the poop instead. So it might be suitable for long-term use in cats. There's not a lot out there that is suitable for cats for pain, so this would be a good thing. Uh, but in Australia and the European Un Union, they have labeled meloxicam, which is the generic of Medicam, uh, at the 0.05 mg per kg daily dose for indefinite use. They're using it long-term in cats with arthritis. And uh, they, it, this study, this one here, showed that it's not causing elevation in kidney enzymes at that dosing, which is great news since probably all cats have kidney issues that we just don't know about. Um, and then they've found also that many cats, once we've tried starting at this dose, we can be backed off at even lower doses and given every other day or every third day rather than daily. So again, lowest possible dose to effect. Um, and that led the uh, International Society for Feline Medicine, as well as the American Association of Feline Practitioners, to change their stance on NSAIDs in cats. And this is huge in the world of veterinary medicine because, again, we used to stay way far away from NSAIDs in cats because that leads to kidney failure. And, uh, and it's been proven otherwise. So um, this was their, their new stance that, hey, maybe it should be used. So does it work if, they, if we use it? Yeah, it does. Um, it's shown that cats are more willing to jump. Their height of their jump increases. Uh, we also see a significant reduction in the joint stiffness. And 
it doesn't mean that we need to ignore doing follow-up with these guys. We still should be checking their kidney enzymes and, and checking for dehydration and checking their blood pressure, making sure that they're handling this okay, including that urinalysis, which tells us what the kidneys are doing before that blood work. Um, one recommendation from some of the feline practitioners was to consider doing a canned-only food uh, if your cat is going to be on NSAIDs long term because it adds moisture to the diet, which is supportive for the kidneys. More moisture, happier kidneys. Call of caution. <laughs> this is a new uh, rabinococcib on, on sear. Uh, this is a new NSAID. It is labeled for use in cats uh, in Europe and in the U.S. Uh, in Europe, they're using it, they're allowed to use it as a six-day stretch. In the U.S., we're only allowed to use it perioperatively, so it has to be related to a surgery, and it can only be used for a maximum of three days. Anything beyond that is considered off-label use, which means it's probably happening, <laughs> but we can't defend it in a court of law. <laughs> uh, corticosteroids, like I said, they have their place. They do inhibit pain and inflammation. There are a lot of side effects associated with them long-term. In cats, they can cause diabetes. Um, they tend to cause uh, increased eating, which if you have an animal that needs to lose weight, not optimal. Um, they also cause them to drink more and then have to urinate more, and then you have more accidents in the house because you have to be on top of helping them get to the outside. It does speed up the progression of osteoarthritis, though it does degrade the cartilage, um, which doesn't do us any favors in the long run. Um, now, there are some cases such as if we're dealing with cancer, where increased drinking, increased appetite, these might be good things in that case. So uh, it is a first-line chemotherapy drug. It also knocks down the replication of neoplastic cells, cancer cells, at least to start with. It's a Band-Aid, but it certainly makes animals feel better when they're really sick with cancer. So uh, other analgesics, which are pain relief, buprenorphine. This is the one where uh, your cat or your small dog has been sent home with a liquid and they tell you to give it in the cheek pouch. And uh, the reason is it's actually absorbed through the gums. You don't actually want to give it down the hatch. It's not going to be absorbed as well. But it's absorbed through the mucosa in the mouth. It is really safe. We don't have to worry about liver kidney issues in general. Although if they do have underlying liver or kidney issues, they might have a lot longer course of sedation <laughs> with this drug. Um, it, but it can be used long term. Generally, it gives about 6 to 12 hours of pain relief depending on the patient. Like I said, transmucosal. Good to note is that it cannot be absorbed sub-Q, not well. And that was something that I did not know before I started this. Um, so injecting buprenorphine, you want to go intramuscular or IV. And that's if you can't get it in the cheek pouch. Uh, it is great for breaking the pain cycle. It does stop that ongoing signaling of the nerves. But they can develop a tolerance. They can become little druggies. <laughs> they can totally come and beg for their bupronex, and <laughs> it's kind of creepy. <laughs> There's the pink elephants. <laughs> um, so other side effects, uh, sedation, of course. Uh, constipation can be a side effect with this medication. Sometimes they'll be too stoned to eat. <laughs> Uh, sometimes they'll be really, really happy, and that is so cute. There's making biscuits everywhere. Um, it has not been shown to be effective in osteoarthritis pain, um, but it's fantastic to have on hand for palliative pain or hospice care. I almost always, if we know that we're getting to the end of a lifespan for a cat, we're going to have buprenex at home and on hand. No, there's Bart again. <laughs> I don't love my dog at all. <laughs> So codeine, uh, it's another good uh, pain medication you might be sent home uh, with from your vet, or they might give you a written prescription to fill at a human pharmacy. Um, the problem with codeine, as far as cats, is that some of these are mixed with acetaminophen, and that's toxic to cats. It will kill them. So um, just keep that in mind. If you are looking for pain control for your cats, you read on Dr. Google that codeine's fine, and then your cat suddenly can't breathe. So that's no coding in cats if you're at all worried that there might be acetaminophen in it. There is limited data about how it's processed in small animals. Uh, they don't know if we actually get good oral absorption with it or not. It certainly makes them stoned. We don't know if it helps with pain. <laughs> uh, there's the stoned. <laughs> 
So again, side effects, sedation, ataxia, which is when they're stumbling around like a drunken sailor, uh, constipation, uh, not wanting to eat, tramadol. This is another one you probably have experienced. Um, it's a pseudo-opioid. It's not in the same class as opioids, but it mimics it very similarly. And opioids mean anything that's kind of a poppy derivative. So tramadol, it's been shown to be effective in alleviating osteoarthritis pain, like it helps animals rest. It's not a good choice as the only analgesic that you're going to do. It should be used in conjunction typically with like a NSAID. Um, there's no published data about how it works for osteoarthritis in cats. Uh, and it's incredibly bitter. So most cats, if you can get this pill down, kudos to you, man. Even if it's been compounded into a flavor, it's still really bitter. And they foam and look like they're having a seizure and paint your walls with it. But <laughs> it's also now a controlled drug, so it's a little more difficult um, for us to send you with. Uh, you have to do the whole written script at the pharmacist or get it filled at your vet. Like I said, very bitter. Shorter half-life than we thought. Um, they are starting to recommend, we used to do twice a day, now maybe every eight hours, but it's turned out we can even dose every six hours in dogs. Um, and <laughs> there's the side effects, sedation, <laughs> uh, constipation, although not as common in tramadol as I see in buprenex or codeine in general. Agitation in cats probably because you've just wrestled them down and stuck a bitter pill down their throat. Uh, <laughs> and then you can adjust the dose if we have kidney or liver impairment. Um, and it's not something that you should use in a patient that has had seizures. There isn't a lot of studies that tell us exactly how this medication works or exactly what the toxicity and safety data is, but we use it a lot in practice. Um, so this is a newer one, gabapentin. Has anyone ever had to deal with gabapentin for yourselves or for your pet? Yeah. It's a really good drug for neurologic pain, and it was developed as an anti-epileptic drug. It's supposed to keep you from having seizures, so it's, it's not a controlled drug, um, but it has been shown that it really helps with that neurologic pain. And when I say neurologic pain, I mean from disc impingement or a nerve injury, um, also some evidence that there might be neurologic pain related to bladder inflammation in cats. Um, there hasn't been a study to evaluate it for osteoarthritis, uh, but in cats, a lot of the specialists are starting to use it as their cornerstone therapy for maladaptive pain, meaning that's the one they go to to break the cycle of pain in cats. I thought that was really interesting. Um, and cats that have been on NSAIDs, got the inflammation under control, they're then able to keep them controlled with the gabapentin. If you get the gabapentin liquid, which is what's labeled for humans, it does have low level of like xylitol, which is toxic to dogs. That's a sugar substitute. Makes it nice and sweet, but um, not great for our pets. Gabapentin can take five to seven days to get to max effect. Uh, and the side effects, sedation. <laughs> So um, with that sedation, it can be profoundly sedating. But if you back it up and do it once a day for a few days and then increase it to twice a day, the sedation tends to go away. They adjust to it. Uh, and weight gain can be a side effect. Cats will act stumbly and off balance. Um, but if you abruptly stop gabapentin, you'll actually have a rebound pain. So it's one that you always taper and one that you keep an eye on the label because that means you have to tell your vet that you're going to need a refill sooner than you think because if we go, if we skip a few doses, this dog's going to be hurting. It is safe for kidneys and liver. Amantadine is a newer drug. This is something that does have to be compounded. Uh, it was an antiviral drug for influenza A, and they're starting to use it in Parkinson's disease in people. And in dogs with osteoarthritis, it's been shown to have um, a synergistic effect with NSAIDs. They did a study with meloxicam, and dogs that had meloxicam and amantadine together actually did better than the ones that were on meloxicam alone. Something that it's a newer drug. We're still trying to decide how we feel about it as a veterinary community. They do have toxicity studies performed on humans and cats, but not dogs. Um, anecdotally, we'll see diarrhea. It is a good medication to add on to animals that don't tolerate NSAIDs very well, and again, we're trying to get that lowest possible dose but keep them happy and moving. 
Like I said, it does have to be compounded though. Uh, it does take a couple of weeks to ramp up in their system. And uh, usually you give it for seven to 14 days and then that knocks down the inflammation and then you can stop it until you feel like the pain is creeping up again and then do another seven to 14 day course. If you have kidney disease, you wanna reduce the dose. Um, amitriptyline, tricyclic antidepressants. These uh, are the first line medication for neuropathic pain in humans now. And they're starting to find some use for it in pain related to animals as well. Uh, they feel like it might work on the same receptors as some of the hardcore drugs, the opioids. Um, and like I said, commonly used in feline cystitis now. That's when they have bladder inflammation. They think it might be related to all pain syndromes in cats. It might help with anything that causes pain. So that's a, kind of an interesting thing that uh, we're all starting to get used to. And the main side effect is sedation. Should not be used with tramadol. Not simpatico. So this is Calder. He's one of my patients up in Alaska, and he likes his crabs. <laughs> um, so glucosamine, now we're on to the chondroprotectants. So glucosamine, it's an amino sugar. It's made from glucose and glutamine. Um, but it is a supplement, and it's derived from shells. See the, see the tie in there? Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> so it's made from the shells of shrimp, lobster, and crab. And uh, there's three forms of it. In short, the N-acetylglucosamine, not the good one. Don't do that one. Uh, can take four to six weeks to build up in their system. Improvements do last for several weeks after you've stopped the supplements. Um, it takes a while for uh, the good effects to discontinue. And it's taken up by the cartilage cells and actually stimulates it to make more fluid in your joints. It stimulates the cartilage to repair and, and also stop some of the destruction that's going on in joints that are breaking down. The other one, chondroitin. You know, these two are usually together, and this is the, the, one of the main building blocks of cartilage. It tends to be found in animal sources only. Um, there aren't really studies that show long-term effectiveness. Uh, they do, and this is debatable, highly debatable, but it might be synergistic with uh, glucosamine, so they are marketed together because of that. Chondroitin is similar to heparin. And what that means, heparin is a very potent anticoagulant. It keeps you from forming a blood clot. So if you're anywhere close to surgery, they'll probably not want you on chondroitin. And in humans, chondroitin has actually been shown to increase the growth and spread of uh, prostate cancer, breast cancer, and melanoma. And so you're supposed to avoid that if that's ongoing in your human world. But we're extrapolating that to mean pets too. So again, they're usually sold together. Um, many pet foods contain these compounds, but they're not at the level that's effective enough. So if you get a prescription joint mobility food, they have to prove that they have the um, dietary or therapeutic dosing recommendation of these two items. If you're getting something over the counter, they don't have to prove that. They can just sprinkle a little glucosamine and chondroitin it in and, uh, and call it a joint food. Side effects, digestive distress. <laughs> Um, it is not a substitute for NSAIDs. It's maybe the first thing that you would choose to start the process of helping your animal with their joints. But if your animal is already having trouble getting around, you know, I would still start with an NSAID and back off on it once you get the inflammation under control. Because this is just going to take a long time to work, and in that meantime, the pain is continuing to build. Chondroprotectants, these are other um, additional things that you can use to help with joints. Adequan, um, this is a fantastic medication that is probably very underutilized in our profession. Um, it provides the body with building blocks of cartilage, and, uh, and then what it's been shown to do in studies is decrease the clinical signs of osteoarthritis. So you start doing the Adequan, animals get better. We use it in humans and in horses as well. Um, it has an indirect anti-inflammatory effect too. It works best when the animal is still able to move um, and the joints are still able to flex. Mm -hmm. um, the Adequan likes to actually go to um, cartilage that's diseased or inflamed, which is nice. It makes it very easy to dose. You don't have to do it in the joint like they started when they first started using this drug. Um, 
they also think that it may have some anti-inflammatory effects on the bladder in cats too that are chronic cystitis patients. So there's the, there's the dosing for dogs, the labeled use. And in one study, 75% uh, of dogs that were started on Anaquan showed remarkable improvement. Their lameness improved. Um, and they, it just keeps their cartilage from breaking down. So they were able to maintain that pain-free uh, that pain free lifestyle for longer. <laughs> Underutilized in cats. It is off-label in cats, but there is enough um, anecdotal information out there that we feel very comfortable using it in cats now. It's very cost-effective in cats. Um, typically, you buy a bottle. This is a 5 mil bottle. And for a 7-pound cat, you'll get about 28 doses out of that bottle, and that's enough to run through a starting course of it. We'll talk about how that, how that works. <laughs> <laughs> so Adequan, it's, it's a series of injections. And uh, we want to do either intramuscular or sub-Q injections. Typically, the vet will do the intramuscular, but if you're doing it at home in your cat, you can totally do sub-Q, and that's fine. Um, and you start out doing injections, oops, wrong button, uh, twice a week for four weeks, and then once a week for four weeks, and then every other week, and then taper to the lowest possible dose. And this is great for dogs, too. It can be a little cost prohibitive in the giant breeds because you have to go through a lot of Adequan. But um, for cats and small dogs, it's much more cost effective. Side effects, again, similar to heparin, shouldn't be used in animals that have issues forming blood clots or if you're looking at doing surgery. But Adequan is fantastic. Uh, a lot of senior cats that... Um, again, have stopped moving and we're doing that pain trial where we're just going to try something and see if they start moving around again. Almost every time I get cats that are suddenly jumping to places that they haven't been able to get to in the last year. MSM, this is just to cover our bases since it's usually thrown in with glucosamine and chondroitin. MSM, it's a naturally occurring um, molecule that's in some green plants, fruits, vegetables, um, it has some antioxidant, anti-inflammatory properties, low toxicity in animals. There aren't a lot of clinical studies. It doesn't cause a lot of side effects. It may help. It's one of those. Uh, just not sure if it's doing anything, but it's probably not hurting. Um, so when we say mild adverse events, uh, what that means, like few and far between, there have been cases in humans of gastrointestinal symptoms, headaches, increased blood pressure, and um, possibly making blood thinning drugs uh, work even better so that people are having trouble forming blood clots. Can cause increased hepatic enzymes. Again, this is mostly in people. They have not done these studies in animals yet. And insomnia. The <laughs> I was so excited when I found this dude. Uh, <laughs> so... These are the avocado soybean unsaponifiables. This is what is in Dasequin. Um, and it's one of those supplements that we have some information about. It's very commonly used in Europe for anyone that has osteoarthritis. Uh, it's a third avocado and two thirds of soybean unsaponifiables, which means it's the oily fraction that's not used in soap. <laughs> it does inhibit cartilage degradation and may increase some of the repair in the joints. So you see a lot of this in some of the um, joint supplements. Also has anti-inflammatory effects. So the omega-3 fatty acids. This is good stuff, clearly. Um, <laughs> the omega-3 fatty acids, every study that they have done with these have just shown more and more positive things in medicine. So it does decrease inflammation, especially around joints. Um, it downregulates the, the genes that are responsible for breaking down the cartilage, for making the enzymes that break down the cartilage. Um, it does increase kidney function in cats, so a lot of the cat specialists are recommending starting them on omega-3s. It is estimated that 20% of dogs that have allergic dermatitis can be managed with omega-3s alone, and that's pretty incredible. Fish oil is the most bioavailable form of omega-3s. There's a lot of plant extract versions, but fish oil is the one you want. Cod liver oil, not the one you want. <laughs> Way too much vitamin A can actually be a toxic level. Um, Long-term use, you're usually able to lower your NSAID dose if you have them on omega-3s. And the clinical studies with this, 
82% of dogs have shown improvement in lameness just on omega-3s. And that's why they're incorporating that into a lot of the joint management diets now too. There was an interesting study I came across too with lymphoma uh, chemo treatment. Uh, the omega-3 fatty acids combined with arginine showed uh, we had a much longer disease-free interval. They had a longer survival time and improved quality of life. So a lot of the oncologists are starting to recommend uh, starting them on omega-3s too. Standard dosing, you know the 1,000 milligram gel capsule that everyone has on their shelf, <laughs> probably from Costco. Um, per 40 pounds of dog, you want one of those capsules, one to two. For cats, if you can do a capsule per cat, kudos to you, because I have never been able to get that much fish oil into my cat. <laughs> But even if you, like I typically will have all my cat's food up on the thing and puncture the capsule and do a squirt in each, yeah. you know, it's great. And it helps with their skin, it helps with their eyes, it helps with their heart. Like there's so many great studies on fish oil. Um, but certainly the most important ones in this case are osteoarthritis pain and um, bladder pain. Um, sometimes we'll have a generalized body odor <laughs> that smells like fish. Um, belching, if your dog comes running up to you after they've had their fish oil, they're like, oh, it's the worst smell ever. So if you actually freeze the capsules before you give it to them, it won't do that. Um, nausea in animals that are sensitive to it, again, anything that goes down the hatch can cause nausea. So start at small doses and see how they do with it. Um, loose stools, again, you're giving them an oil. <laughs> you're, you're greasing the tube, so that might happen. <laughs> Um, theoretically, they might be able to cause increased bleeding at high doses. These were people that were taking, this is a human study, and these were people that were taking nine of those thousand milligram capsules a day. Yeah, and talk about loose stool. I mean, I can't, wow. So, so theoretical, but no one's been able to get that much fish oil down an animal. Um, and it, when we're worried about heavy metal contamination, that's typically in the meat of fish. It's not in the oil, so we don't have to worry about that with this. Um, long term, a lot of the omega-3 fatty acid supplements will also have vitamin E mixed into them. A lot of the diets will, some of the supplements. And the reason is that long term dosing might deplete the vitamin E levels. So this is some of the fun stuff. So um, class four therapy laser. This is my favorite toy. Favorite, favorite toy that I have at my hospital. <laughs> the way that a class four therapy laser works, it is photobiomodulation. And what that means is that it increases ATP and that's the, the fuel for cells to regenerate themselves. Um, so it relieves pain by releasing endorphins. It also relax, relaxes the muscles. Um, it reduces inflammation. Uh, and how it does it causes vasodilation. All your blood vessels dilate, it's nice and warm. Uh, and it accelerates the reabsorption of hematomas. I haven't had to cut an ear hematoma in probably five years since more of the class four therapy lasers have been out. Um, several treatments with a laser and that hematoma is absorbed, the inflammation's down, it's amazing. Um, it does promote lymphatic flow too, so it's going to decrease edema. And, uh, and then also uh, another route of inflammation uh, with prostaglandins is decreased too. It is an FDA approved uh, for use in people. Uh, most of the sports teams actually have class 4 therapy lasers and use them to get their players healed faster and back out on the field or the court. Uh, other ways that it works, it makes uh, damaged tissues. It actually infuses new, it stimulates growth of new capillaries into that tissue that probably weren't getting good blood flow because they were damaged. It also reduces fibrous tissue formation, which means it makes it so you're less likely to scar, and it helps break down scar tissue that's already there. Uh, it improves nerve function. It's a needleless way to do acupuncture. You can stimulate acupuncture sites with a laser rather than doing needles. And this is, and this is Doc Brock, my, my associate, and this is Duncan Liu Hu. You guys have probably seen him. He's, he's super famous now, but he still comes to see us for his laser treatments. If you're not familiar with Duncan Liu Hu, he is missing both back legs, and uh, so he tends to get some tendonitis in his front legs because he's, and this dog does not walk. He runs. So 
his joints get a little inflamed. And he comes in and gets his class four therapy laser treatment. So Duncan Liu who uh, gets laser treatment, and he's down to like once a month or sometimes even every six weeks because it keeps it in check for him. And uh, it's really useful in traumatic wounds. I have a case study about that coming up here next. Um, really good for osteoarthritis, neurologic pain, bladder inflammation, dental pain. If you have an animal that's not going to do well for a dental, sometimes we'll do antibiotics and laser treatments, and it'll help keep them managed. Also, we'll do it post-op, um, especially for dental extractions. It works great. Not for use in eyes. <laughs> Just like the laser tr that you play with with your cat, you don't want to be shining this in your retinas. This is Duncan Liu and Muggsy. <laughs> these, both of these guys are through Panda Paws Rescue, and they're both missing their back legs now. And so they both came in for their laser treatment. And when they're getting laser treatment, they wear these protective goggles so that <laughs> if they turn around and look at your, what are you doing back there? They're not going to get anything affected in their eyes. And they're just super cute. You can't help putting goggles on dogs. Gonads, don't use them in gonads. <laughs> and you don't want to laser cancer because you don't want cell replication in cancer. Um, and that's why we usually recommend screening rads if there's a questionable area, like we have some swelling on a leg. Probably want to make sure that's not cancer before we start lasering it. It's non-invasive. It's not surgical. It doesn't hurt. Sometimes they'll have a pins and needles feeling after the first starts because you're increasing blood flow to an area that probably hasn't had that for a long time. Um, so they might be a little sore the first night or the first couple treatments, but in general, we have dogs that run in to get their laser treatment. They're super excited about it because they feel better afterwards. And it's warm, and they're like, yeah. So acupuncture, um, generally considered safe. Of course, a lab is going to let you stick needles in them, and be like, I'm cute from a picture too. Decreases muscle spasm. It does promote release of endorphins and serotonin. It makes them feel good. Decreases neural pain. Um, there was a study in dogs that had um, herniated disc surgery uh, where they go in and they take out the, the part of the disc that is ruptured and is impinging on the spinal cord. And they showed that with uh, electroacupuncture afterwards, they had less pain than those that just had surgery alone. So it does help. Um, I am not certified in acupuncture, and that is probably the extent of what I know about acupuncture. <laughs> so if you uh, would like more information on it, I'm sure I can find a, a source for you. And it, like I said, the acupuncture uh, points can be stimulated by the laser, too. Physical therapy. Um, this is stuff that you guys can do at home. And uh, the goal of physical therapy, we want to decrease pain, we want to increase strength, and we want to improve the stability of that animal so they're not falling down and make their joints able to move. So heat and cold, you can certainly do a hot compress. It's going to decrease pain transmission. It's going to decrease muscle spasm. Cold, it's going to be anti-inflammatory, decreases uh, muscle activity and nerve conduction so it's not sending out that pain signal. And then it also, I did not know this, releases opioids in your system. <laughs> so... Other important physical therapy, stretching. <laughs> so passive range of motion, that's where you're putting a joint through every range that it should be able to do. Um, low impact exercise, this is one that's really important. So if you want to build endurance in muscles, you have to exercise for 10 minutes or more. And that can, we might look like that beagle that said, I'm done. <laughs> so it's a process to work up to it, but you want to work up to 10 minutes of exercise in an animal that has possible osteoarthritis pain. And even uh, bladder inflammation too, it's been shown to really help. Daily is optimal. You wanna do it the slowest without lameness. So there's some dogs that once you get to a certain amount, they're gonna start really limping or they're gonna start just picking up that leg to go. And you want to walk the slowest pace that they're still walking normally. If they're in the middle of an osteoarthritic flare up, don't do it. Just let them rest and get through that and use your drugs. Cats are not exempt from physical therapy. Uh, they should have active playtime. And <laughs> there is a right way to play with a cat. And this sounds amazing, but it's true. Um, you actually want to have an interactive playtime with a cat. So something at the end of a string or a laser where they're chasing it. And what we're trying to do is uh, simulate a kill in the wild. And what that does for them is it releases um, stress hormones so that they actually feel better after their play session. 
And then you want to reward them with, they get to take the, the kill and run off with it, whether they're stealing the toy and leaving, or um, if you're using a laser pointer, you want to give them a treat at the end, simulating, yes, you got it, you killed it, you ate it. <laughs> Catnip and treats can help stimulate them to play more. Um, the benefits, we want to do weight loss, stress release. It's also a way for them to bond with you. You know, they've been withdrawing, and this is something that can kind of bring them back. And typically, if you start doing it at a certain time of the day, repeatedly, they start to look forward to it. Even if they're not sure what you're doing, they're going to come watch the human and see why they're going to wave that feather around. So, and eventually, they'll work towards interacting. More dogs and helmets. So these are a couple case studies of animals that we've treated at our hospital. <laughs> so this was Sissy. Oh my gosh, she's so cute. She came into Lovers Not Fighters as a rescue dog. And uh, she's a two-year-old female spade pit bull. She was put into a foster home. And the foster decided at the same time to take in another animal from someone who was living on the street. And that dog um, was in a totally separate part of the house that had a screen door that went to the backyard. And the dog busted through the screen door while Sissy was outside going potty and mauled her. Um, she initially had surgery at an ER uh, where they sewed up everything that was torn up. And uh, they found that she had puncture wounds on the back of her neck and on both of her front legs. And the big ones were over her neck, or I'm sorry, over her face. She was doing this to protect her neck and got mauled all around her face. Um, she, in that, the dog grabbed and actually fractured her maxilla and her palate. Um, she had a lot of holes. And she's, she's a fantastic, like, she didn't fight back at all. This poor girl. Um, so I want to warn you, the next picture does show kind of where we started with her, and it might be a little graphic. So it's not horrible. It's just there's blood in it. And I want you to pay special attention to how her nose looks here, because this is normal for her. This is where she was at after. She couldn't eat anything hard. She couldn't pick up anything that wasn't super soft because of the palate fracture. And, um, and she had lacerations all on the inside of her mouth and on the outside. So she was started on antibiotics, tramadol, carprofen, gabapentin, everything in the toolbox. Uh, and then laser treatments ended up being a huge deal for her. Laser treatments are fantastic for wounds. And this is the first treatment and I kid you not, this is 45 minutes after this picture was taken. And, uh, and that's with one laser treatment. And then this was four weeks later. Or sorry, four treatments later, which ended up two weeks later. And this was right before, and this was right after. Yeah, it's amazing. And honestly, I wasn't the one that even took these pictures. The rescue group took them. And uh, they're like, this is amazing. you got to see this. I'm like, oh, yeah, sure, it does. It does a great job. And then they show me. I'm like, whoa, <laughs> that is awesome. Can I have this? Yeah. So she did great. We ended up doing an oral exploratory after the about four to six weeks. We wanted to see if there was any teeth that needed to come out, any fractures that needed to still be repaired, um, what was the damage. And the, honestly, the only thing, she still had some sutures in there that hadn't dissolved yet. And the rest of her mouth completely healed, completely. The palate was fine. We took x-rays of every direction because I was sure something must be jacked up in there. This is what she looks like now. <laughs> and the amazing thing about this, too, we really thought she would have scarring all over her face, which is not that big of an issue in animals in general. But when you're trying to adopt out a pit bull, yeah, that's a problem. Um, so much more comfortable in her mouth, no scars. She got adopted. And we still get lots of good pictures over. Mm -hmm. um, this was Sierra. I only have two of these, honest. Two more. Um, Sierra was a 12-year-old female spade German Shepherd. She came in to us because the owner actually came to one of the ACT talks on how to take care of your senior pet. And she came into my hospital and said, I wrote it off as being old, and my dog needs help. And I was like, wow, that's amazing. And that's actually how I got in touch with Daniela to tell her this uh, revelation the owner had from coming to one of the talks here. And so she came in, and she's, she's 12. I mean, she was walking hunched, tucked down. Um, she, there's a new puppy in the house who's 10 months old. She wanted nothing to do with him. He was not allowed near her. She would growl. She did not want him touching her. She was afraid he was going to jump on her. 
She had difficulty rising or lying down, and she had a lick granuloma that had been over her left hind limb for years. Oh. Yeah, that, that ick. On her physical exam, she had muscle atrophy on her spine and both back legs. She had this large ulceration, that's the lick granuloma. And she had lumbosacral pain, especially with German Shepherd's hips, no bueno. Um, she did have good neurologic function to both back legs, though, which a lot of older dogs will lose if they have degenerative joint disease in their hips. And is that where the foot falls? Yep, that's where exactly where they stand on the top of their foot when they shouldn't. So she had good function back there. We did a full workup on her. Um, she did have some elevated kidney enzymes, which was surprising. So we were not going to do anti-inflammatories in her. Uh, as a last resort, we had a bunch of other tools in the toolbox that we were going to try first. Did a urinalysis on her, and that showed the dilute urine as well. Did a culture and sensitivity of that lick granuloma, too. And uh, she did decline radiographs to start with. Um, treatment plan, there were three different pathogens in that granuloma when we cultured it out. We did start her on a um, certain antibiotic and then ended up changing it based on the culture results. Uh, and then we started doing laser treatment, and we did this over her lumbosacral area, uh, which is lower back going into the hips and then all down her back legs. And there she is getting her laser treatment. Um, she bosses around my staff. It's hilarious. She, she comes in. This is her spa day, and she comes in, and she gets cheese, and she barks at you if you don't give her the cheese when she wants the cheese. <laughs> She's, and they all get, they're like, oh, Sierra. <laughs> so we focus on hips and spine. We also did laser treatment over that lick granuloma. And uh, we started her on a kidney diet and on Adequan injections, too. And, uh, and then a supplement that we use in our hospital called Phycox Max. And, uh, and it's a, it contains most of the things that we talked about earlier supplement-wise. Um, physical therapy, these were things that the owners were doing at home. We needed to build muscle mass in those back legs. So she's walking on hills. And, uh, and that helps to really focus on using those back legs in a manner that she can't change the weight to her front legs. Um, also, message, <laughs> massage. <laughs> so you know, doing a lot of massage, especially on her front shoulders, because with both her back legs affected, she shifted her weight to the front legs. And that causes a lot of muscle tension, and she can't lose two more legs, you know. <laughs> um, stretching uh, and cheese therapy, lots of cheese therapy. <laughs> so I wish I could tell you that I fixed this lit granuloma. She got it lasered. Like I said, there were three pathogens. We started on clindamycin, went to doxycycline. We had it covered. She would rip the cover off. Keeping an e-collar on a 12-year-old German Shepherd was not a good quality of life for her. Um, we did try Zilkeen, which is for anxiety, as a supplement. It didn't seem like it helped in case this was a, a nervous stress lick thing. Um, we did treatment with topical honey. Uh, it seemed like it, was, it made a huge improvement. And then she uh, tore it apart one day when she was having a lot of changes at home. So uh, we have not done an x-ray on this joint. Unfortunately, we're talking about that as a next step. Um, the only thing that it would change would be help determine if we're going to keep lasering it or not. Um, and then the laser actually has a lick granuloma setting because it's so common. Um, we reassessed her kidney values are now within the normal limits. She chases and plays with the other dogs, which is important because I just brought this little cutie home. <laughs> so now she has a, a little over a year old shepherd and then this little girl, she's huge, but she's only <laughs> three months. Wow. Yeah, she's going to be a big one. <laughs> so. Um, she's actually playing with them. The owner showed me this awesome video of her chasing them around the backyard, telling them what for. And uh, so we continue to do laser treatments on her. Like I said, it's her spa treatment. She actually kicked the other dogs out of the car because they're not allowed to come to spa treatment. And she's still on Adequan. We did the two doses twice a week, and now we've tapered off. Uh, now she gets it once a week, and uh, when she goes longer than that, she starts to have a little more trouble, so we've been maintaining about once a week. And then she continues on the, the joint supplement. So, and then this guy, this is Bo the Beagle. I want you guys to watch how he walks and see if you can tell me what hurts. Sure. Easy, easy. One thing to watch is, yes, good eye. When they put their foot down and the head goes up, that's the one that hurts. So it's like you stepped on something and you're like... And he's a little tricky, too, because you see he's lifting up this back leg as well. 
So this is what happened to Bo. See if you can see the, the issue. It's a shoulder fracture. He was hit by a car. And uh, so, yeah, this should look like that. And it's in two pieces. They actually, he was found in a ditch and taken to the ER. Um, he was not owned by the particular family member who ended up coming in and, and taking him. Um, so someone in the family that he belonged to previously was like, I love that dog. I'm taking care of that dog. Um, so she came in and took over ownership and uh, did as best she could for some of his issues. This is another uh, showing what else he had wrong. His left pelvis, this should be straight like a box, and it's crushed in. This was actually pushed through uh, and fractured this hip. And then his tibia is also broken. He had a lot of stuff. He was seen at Tanisborn Emergency, and they stabilized this fracture for them. Um, the pelvic fracture, you tend to leave it. Um, they actually will heal it themselves in six to eight weeks if you can keep them quiet, because uh, trying to plate a pelvis is very hard, uh, and it just might not be necessary. Uh, so he received uh, an epidural, and we had to give him drugs to transport him. Um, so he was started on carprofen, codeine, and gabapentin. And then we started him also on class 4 laser therapy treatment. And uh, we did this daily to start with and then went to twice a week. Um, the owner was able to pay for the fractured leg, but there wasn't much that they could do for the shoulder. Um, unfortunately, she couldn't afford an orthopedic surgeon and had already taken on a huge amount with this dog. Um, they started physical therapy after the first week, um, ice packing the area uh, five to ten minutes twice a day. Um, by the way, he was intact when he was out running around and got hit by a car and then got neutered while he got everything else fixed, so, so he had an additional place to ice pack. Um, <laughs> and then passive range of motion, um, trying to make sure that he still, nothing seized up in that back leg that was so fractured. Um, if they stop using it, all those ligaments are going to tighten down and he's not going to have good function when he can use it. Uh, and then assisted weight bearing, trying to make him stand and bear weight on that leg. It actually does speed up the healing process, but you don't want them walking on a fractured hip like that. So just bearing weight on it, as well as the front shoulder, <laughs> his, his contralateral fractures. Um, we rechecked at eight weeks. The implants heal great. Uh, he, I walked into the room and he was jumping on and off the chair. And I was like, oh, God, don't do that. <laughs> I don't know if everything's healed yet. Um, but uh, his left pelvic fracture was now stabilized with a nice big bony callus. And then the right shoulder still remains unstable. He still does the head bob when he walks on it. But that little fracture piece that we saw is not actually in the joint. So it's not causing problems. It just is a functional injury. And it's going to be predisposed to degenerative joint disease. We started him on... Um, the joint supplement that I use, the Ficox Max, to, again, to prevent osteoarthritis that's going to develop in these joints now. Um, and then they continue doing passive range of motion and stretching and massage at home. Um, if he does have a flare-up, they're going to come in and do some laser therapy with that. And then I just want to thank you guys. I know this has been really long. <laughs> and thank you to Daniela for putting this together and for having the animal community talks. Like I said, it made a huge difference to my owner, and it's amazing what you do. Um, and thank you to the owners and rescues that let me share the stories of their animals that we've treated. And for you guys coming in on a sunny day in Portland <laughs> and bearing with me. <laughs>